Good morning, uh, everybody in uh, Southeast Asia, as well as those participating uh, in Japan or other parts of the world. And also, I'd like to say hello to my friends at Singapore Management University, which, of course, has uh, an arrangement, an exchange arrangement with the Osaka School of International Public Policy, uh, where I belong. And uh, as uh, Joe has kindly uh, introduced, I am the co-director of the IFO Research Center, which is located inside the, the, the international uh, uh, OSIP. Um, and so, um, and I don't know if I have experiences in international education as a profession, but certainly as he's introduced, I have gone through uh, uh, various phases of uh, <laughs> a, a different educational experiences in different countries. And um, I did go to Japanese schools too. Uh, when I was very young. Anyway, um, I'm very, very, uh, so um, as uh, Dr. Haldane has said, um, I will be your uh, moderator for the morning sessions, including moderating uh, Philip Sugai's uh, presentation on values, which I think is a very appropriate uh, opening theme for this conference in partnership with Singapore Management University, which I, I know that uh, excels in these areas of uh, business, sustainability, as well as sort of innovative educational thinking all around. So um, I would like to give uh, the floor to Philip uh, so that although his session is supposed to start at 10 past, but um, since we have a lot of time, I don't want to uh, waste it with my ramblings. Uh, just before we start uh, with uh, uh, Philip, um, I'd like to say he will be talking for about half an hour to 35 minutes, and uh, we will have Q&A for about 10-15 uh, minutes. Uh, so for the questions, in our, uh, we would very much encourage you to post them in advance, hopefully in the chat room, uh, so, um, so that I will be able to, Philip and I will be able to look at them and uh, Hopefully, we'll have too many questions that we won't be able to answer all of them. <laughs> so without further ado, Philip, uh, please, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Joe. Thank you very much, Haruko. It's great to be here uh, this morning. And um, especially around the theme of education uh, throughout ASEAN uh, and uh, specifically um, focusing on value today. And so uh, what I would love to do is, again, if you have questions as I go through my presentation, please feel free to post them in the chat window. Uh, and I will be doing a couple of interactive things throughout the session. So um, hopefully uh, we can keep this lively, even though I'm not personally uh, in front of all of you in a face-to-face -face setting. So um, let me start out by sharing my screen. And uh, the theme today that I would like to actually get into uh, with all of you is uh, research work that uh, my team and I here uh, in Kyoto have been working on. Uh, and the goal here, when we talk about sustainability, uh, ESG, uh, sustainability reporting, um, the, the issue of what does that actually mean in terms of measurement? And uh, that's one of the themes that we've been diving into uh, in a great deal of detail uh, over these last three months. So I'd like to update you uh, on where it is that we stand. So uh, I've done this work together with uh, a fairly large team. Uh, two of the leaders uh, in terms of uh, my research assistants are Sain and Paul from Thailand. Uh, and uh, thank you to everybody uh, who's actually been a part of this. So my name is Philip Sugai. I'm a full-time uh, marketing professor uh, at Doshi University in Kyoto. Uh, if you'd like to reach out to me, please feel free to reach out by email um, or LinkedIn. And uh, you'll notice uh, at the bottom left of this slide, uh, I've published a book recently on building value through marketing. And the issue again uh, at the heart of this is how do we measure that value that everyone is talking about? And so before we get there, um, why should we be talking about value? Why is this important now, especially uh, in the middle of uh, a global crisis, um, you know, economically, uh, health related uh, and in, across other factors? And one of the foundations that I like to use in my thinking is 
the fantastic work of uh, Professor Hans Rosling and his team. Uh, he's unfortunately passed away, but uh, the work that he was doing continues uh, at uh, Gapminder. And I'm not sure if you've followed uh, some of the arguments and some of the research that they've done, um, but as a first test for all of you this morning, just to make sure that I've uh, got a live audience working with me today. Um, back in 1820, nearly 90% of the world's population lived in extreme poverty. That's less than $2 a day. Okay. And so my question for all of you is in 2019, so the last time that we've actually got recorded data on this uh, in recent history, what is that level today? What percentage of the world's population is living in extreme poverty? Okay, and what I'd like you to do is actually, I've prepared a, a Mentimeter uh, survey here. So if you just go to www.menti.com and when it asks you, just type in the code 9011-0598 and you should actually be able to vote. And so um, I'll, change my sharing so that we can see this live and online. But this is the actual um, page live right now on Menti. So if you can please go to www.menti.com. You can use any device and I believe it's accessible anywhere in the world. Um, tell me what percentage you believe uh, of the world is living in extreme poverty uh, today. And you can see hopefully live as people are answering uh, in the session. Um, the numbers should start coming in live. So again, in 1820, uh, there, there were a significant amount of people who were living in extreme poverty. Uh, it was nearly 90%. And so today, what, what percentage of the population is actually living in extreme poverty? So I, let me see if we've got... Ah, here come the votes. All right, please keep them coming. I've got a live audience. That's great. So please keep them coming. What percentage of the world's total population today? It was 90% in the 1820s or 1820. What is it today? So I'll wait for maybe a few more votes. I just need to be careful of my time in terms of presentation. Um, so we've got the majority, it's between 30 to 40% and 61 to 75% right now. Any other votes for anybody who's out there? What percentage of the world's population in 2019, so two years ago, um, was living in extreme poverty? And this is before um, the COVID-19 crisis, so maybe there's been a little bit of a um, fallback, but in 2019, what do you imagine? So it seems like uh, we've got about five people, the winners seem to be 61 to 75%, but uh, a strong group of you, uh, 10 of you uh, are down a little lower. Um, I'll leave this for you. So I'll, I'll see if I can return back to this vote towards the end of the presentation. Uh, you know what, I'll, I'll tell you what happened. <laughs> I, I won't leave you in suspense. So let's go back to uh, the presentation so we can see basically um, I've taken this data from Gapminder, and if you haven't played with this data, it's really great data to play with. But um, this is a speeded up, uh, a quick version uh, of one of their maps. But you can see basically um, that as time evolves, this total number um, is 10%. Okay, so basically, in terms of the world's population, um, it's that zero to 10% range that we uh, have gotten ourselves into. So that means that as a world, uh, as seven plus billion of us globally, uh, we have been able to sort of move up in terms of, um, I'll show you that again, just so you can see it, but it's, it's been a, an incredible growth. And this is driven uh, in a large part by obviously business uh, and uh, the Asian and ASEAN region has been and continues to be a key driver. Um, but this growth, so the exciting thing is we are managing to get people up out of extreme poverty into the higher levels uh, that the Gapminder team has been talking about, level one through level four. 
um, but they're coming at some significant negative impacts. So at negative impacts on the environment, on employees, on customers, on partners. And so you're probably seeing the news releases every day just as much as I am. And so all this growth is great in terms of helping lift people out of poverty, but it's coming at a cost. And these costs now today are becoming fairly significant. And um, maybe one of the key thinkers or the key reasons behind this sort of mismatch between growth and impacts uh, comes from Milton Friedman. Uh, and if you haven't read his 1970 New York Times, uh, New York Magazine piece, I strongly recommend that you do because it's actually telling and important even today. And he basically said that, okay, well, the purpose of a business is to make profit. That, that's it. Uh, and as long as that business uh, does it within the rules of law and within ethical custom, then that's okay. And so our research uh, here in Kyoto has been around what specifically is that ethical custom? What are the customs that actually um, surround business processes? And more specifically, what are the ethics underneath this? So Milton Friedman's thinking and the thinking that really I learned when I was in business school was that the primary responsibility of a company is to itself and its shareholders and that everything else is an externality. But we're seeing now that the impacts on those externalities are overwhelming and may actually lead to some significant negative issues um, going forward, respect to climate, uh, equality, uh, all, all different uh, issues that seem to be coming to the fore now that aren't a part of uh, that standard or the old way, Milton Friedman way of thinking about business. So for those of you who have studied Japan or Japanese business, one of the key elements of um, Japanese capitalism or thinking about business uh, from the Japanese perspective has been the inclusion of ethics from the very beginning. Uh, and so people like Ishida Baigan influenced uh, these folks, the Omi merchants that uh, were uh, in business back uh, hundreds of years, 1700s and potentially even earlier. And they had this philosophy of Sampo Yoshi, which is the three goods. And their three goods are in order for a business to be good, in order for it to be a good business, it has to be good for the seller, of course, but also good for the buyer and good for society. And you'll see this Sampo Yoshi philosophy continued even until today. So uh, if those of you, some of you may have heard of Itochu, um, the founder of Itochu and actually the founder of Marubeni too, they're some of the world's and Japan's largest trading companies. They're actually evolved from Omi merchants and they have this at the heart of their management philosophy. Um, and so uh, again, if you're in Japan or, or can access NHK, uh, right now uh, the Taiga drama, the NHK national drama is on this guy, uh, Shibusawa Eichi, uh, who wrote a book called Rongo and Soroban and has been called the father of Japanese capitalism. And his book, Rongo and Soroban, translated into English or at least commented on in English. The title is called Ethical Capitalism. And his quote here is that basically, um, he considers whether or not the business should be started and prosper from the standpoint of active morality. And second, he thinks about profit and loss. So is it ethical first? Is it adding value to society and, um, and to the world that it's being brought into? And then he's talking about profits. Uh, and this also inspired uh, Matsushita, uh, K. Matsushita, who's the founder of Panasonic. Uh, and I think as an answer to Milton Friedman, they were operating around the same time. He said, to me, it's simply unthinkable for a public facility or a public a business that produces goods and employs a large number of people not to make a positive contribution to society. So you can see that there's a different way of thinking about capitalism and business um, that's at the heart of uh, how Japan has actually approached uh, at least the philosophical thinking about business. And so that brings me back to these four income levels uh, that Hans Rosling and the Gapminder team have. And I wonder once we're successful in getting people up out of extreme poverty, move them up from level two to level three, and ultimately the goal is getting people up to level four. But once we get there, is there a level five that we should be aiming for beyond level four that includes an ethics of responsibility. And I think this discussion is going on, you know, 
globally right now? Is there something more once we get to a certain level of income and a certain level of, of success that we really must be thinking about? And so you'll see this um, in 2019, the Business Roundtable, which is a group of Americas and in many ways, the world's largest companies committing to a purpose of a company is no longer the Milton Friedman model, but it's a model of um, uh, doing good and creating value, not only for the business and its shareholders, but you can see here it's customers, employees, uh, our suppliers, our partners, uh, our communities, society, and the planet, uh, the environment. So they're listing out seven key stakeholders that a business needs to be creating value for. And in the same year, actually, uh, Klaus Schwab from World Economic Forum proposed the Davos Manifesto and basically, or Davos Manifesto 2020, saying again that the purpose of a company goes beyond just making money for shareholders and should be creating value for those seven stakeholders. Okay, so the Business Roundtable is saying something, the purpose of the company is to make, uh, create value for uh, seven stakeholders. World Economic Forum is saying the same exact thing. Thankfully, my book is also saying the same thing. Um, and here's again, uh, Charles Schwab promoting this idea of stakeholder capitalism, okay? So the word that the world has been using up until now about this has been a, a move towards stakeholder capitalism. Um, but uh, when we look at companies, here's one of the signatories of the Business Roundtable's um, uh, stakeholder capitalism style uh, manifesto. Uh, and if you go to the Coca-Cola website right now, you can find their sustainability practice uh, and you can find them actually talking about a commitment to um, reclaiming 100% of the plastic that they actually send out into the world in, in terms of the bottles uh, of soda that they sell or, or beverages. But at the very exact same time, an independent group of volunteers has gone around to beaches globally uh, for multiple years now. And once again, even at the same exact time, right now, uh, May 14th, 2021, Coca-Cola's website is talking about its commitment to reclaiming all of the plastic that uh, it actually sends out into the world. They're being found out by um, a feedback loop, uh, somebody in an outside auditing group, that they are the world's largest plastic polluter. So even though a company says something, uses very nice words to say something, when it's matched up against a feedback loop, um, maybe reality doesn't match with what it is that the company is saying. And so what, what would you call this practice? Um, ah, we're, all, we're all muted, so um, maybe you can type into the chat window. What do we call this practice of saying something about the environment, something that we're doing good for the environment, when in actu actuality we're doing something different? What, what, what do you call that? What, what is that practice? <laughs> OK, good. There's, there's a better term for it than that, that probably a lot of people know about. And any, any word come to mind? A company says something environmentally friendly. Um, yes, it's mismatched. But any, any idea what that's called? Okay, tell, tell me if, tell me if this, this word actually comes to your mind or if you've heard of this, of greenwashing. So basically, um, when companies do something for the environment, they say one thing and do another, it's regularly called greenwashing. Um, but what happens, what happens when it's not related, a company says something and does another thing not related to the environment? So for example, a major multinational tech manufacturer has a color picture filled brochure talking about all the great ways it add, adds value to society and, and how its employees are volunteering while at the same time avoiding all municipal state and federal taxes. What do you, what do you call that? Um, or uh, in this case, um, you've got a major e-commerce company um, puts its employees under such terrible working conditions that they don't have time to use the toilet, don't have time to use the restroom during their break 
And at the very same time on their website, that e-commerce company is talking about how great it takes care of its employees, even while they, they need to use plastic bags to relieve themselves, right? And that, that's horrible, but we don't have a name for that. <laughs> we don't have a name for any of these. So the word that I've proposed recently is uh, value washing. And so this is actions taken by organizations to misrepresent the value outcomes um, for themselves or their stakeholders. Um, so they do say one thing, but do something else. Whether it's for the company or its shareholders or the environment or its partners or its employees or its customers, uh, that's all different types of value washing. And basically a way for a company to value wash is that it doesn't ever give clear goals uh, for what they say, or they don't provide any objective measures for these goals. They avoid transparency. So the Coca-Cola example I gave you before, there was a lack of transparency on the amount of uh, plastic that actually is being put out into the world. Plus, they don't have any objective third-party feedback loops. So there's no one out there actually um, helping or talking about what it is that they're doing. And the fifth thing that we found is that also companies are working to create a complexity of terms, systems, or words so that normal, regular people, students, even faculty or researchers can't understand what it is that actually companies are talking about. So if you're going to value wash, these are the things you should do. And if we're going to stop value washing, um, we need to have these things in mind. And so unfortunately, the research that we've found is that stakeholder capitalism has given value washing superpowers. And so um, the term that I like to use, and it's based on this Japanese business philosophy that I explained earlier, is this idea of ethical capitalism. Um, and so I'll explain exactly uh, why I'm saying this uh, in a couple of minutes, but just this idea of value washing has come to be the central theme um, that the research that I'm doing is trying to fight against. Um, so what we did, uh, thankfully with the help of some research funding from Doshishi University, uh, I was able to hire uh, a team of research assistants. And what we ended up doing is looking through 15, actually more than 15, but here uh, 15 of the world's largest uh, sustainability reporting uh, and disclosure frameworks, um, including obviously the Sustainable Development Goals, GRI, SASB, uh, BIA, um, all of the ones that we typically have heard about or, or were told about were included in our analysis. And basically what we did is that first we collected every measure of value that these organizations actually talk about. So all ESG dis disclosures, uh, ESG is environment, society, and governance. Um, and so any ESG disclosure, um, this is an example of one from GRI, this is GRI disclosure 202-1. So we collected 357 of these things, okay, from uh, every one of those 15 organizations. Uh, actually BIA, the, the B-Lab, um, organization has more than, I think, 10,000 uh, different questions that it's asking, but we could actually access all of those and sort of match those into our model as well. But the ones that we're focusing on here are the, the 357 uh, major ones uh, that were collected across these 15. And we basically put them into an Excel database like this. So we listed, um, these are no longer in order because I was playing with them, but we listed one to 357 uh, with the source of uh, the indicator uh, and its actual uh, measurement and what it's talking about. Okay, so again, that's what it looked like. And what we ended up doing uh, is taking all of those 357 indicators and putting them into these seven categories. And what we found is that most of the indicators out there, when people are talking about measuring value for these stakeholders uh, in the stakeholder capitalism model, 32% of these are in for employees, 25% for the environment, 13 for society, 14 for firm, customer partners, and then zero for shareholders. And at first we were shocked that there were no indicators for shareholders, but then we realized that Milton Friedman, you know, back in 1970 had inspired this idea of 
um, shareholder first. And so all the measures of shareholder value that we have right now, whether it's earnings per share, whether it's economic uh, value added, profitability, you know, whatever it is that people are using to evaluate profitability already exists. So it didn't need to be included in these other um, measurement frameworks. So even though it was an initial surprise when we thought about it, it kind of made sense. Um, and so then what we did is within each of those uh, seven categories, we grouped the indicators by themes. And so we arrived at 27, we're calling the macro indicators because we all of those 357 that we took, we called the micro indicators. So we made groups and called them macro indicators and they formed around themes. So when somebody is talking about employee value in the world of sustainability reporting or ESG, what they actually are talking about are fair wages, uh, health, welfare, and safety, development, engagement and satisfaction, diversity and equity, and human rights. That's what they're talking about. And there's no other things that they're actually looking at measuring. So for each area, environment, they're talking about waste and pollution. That includes greenhouse gas emissions, um, effluent waste out of um, your factories with water, um, water itself, energy, products themselves, biodiversity and buildings and land. So we went through each one and uh, got clear themes. So out of 357 indicators, we could narrow it down to 27 um, macro indicators uh, across all of these uh, value actors. So again, when companies talk about value, these are the benchmarks against which their actions can be measured because from all of those organizations we looked at, that's how they're measuring value. Um, okay, so once we did that, then we actually said, okay, within each of these themes, how good are they at actually avoiding value washing, actually helping companies to actually do what they say? Uh, and I used actually too much in that, but the idea is that we're looking to understand whether or not companies are being held accountable, or if they are, how they're being held accountable for the things that they're doing. So we looked at each of these indicators and asked ourselves, is it goal-based? Yes or no? Is there a clear goal that this indicator is talking about or not? Two, is it objectively measured? Do they offer clear objective measurements that are logical and reasonable? We can understand if I ask my students or ask the small shop down the street from me, could you actually measure this thing? If it's objectively measured in a clear and logical way, they should be able to say yes. Okay. Third is, do they have independent feedback loops? Just like the Coca-Cola example I gave before, when they say something, is there an independent auditor out there that can help confirm that the thing that they're saying is actually being done? So um, we had a three level scale on this. Zero, if it wasn't independently checkable. Two, if it was, but we didn't have any indication that this was a clearly open and transparent uh, metric that anybody could do. And two, if it was independently checkable and we could have evidence that it was being done. Uh, and the third uh, final variable was uh, uh, check was whether or not it was a scale variable. And does this go beyond yes, no answers to provide some type of measurable thing? And so just so you understand in some frameworks, they ask about uh, the percentage of uh, female or women uh, board members. And the answer that you give, if it's just, you know, are there women on your board, yes or no, that's not a good indicator. Um, and so we need some type of level. What percentage, what number is actually there of your total board members? Uh, and so that's basically the test that we put each of these 357 indicators through. So the top score that an indicator could get is five. And uh, again, this is how the process looked and you can see uh, each uh, of the indicators got a score uh, and a number. And I won't bore you uh, with the details because it gets quite complicated, but the results um, came out like this. So we could actually prove now each of those 27 micro and in macro indicators um, it existed, how many uh, indicators are included in each one of the things that we found. So for example, for environment water, there are 20 indicators across six different frameworks 
that talk about water. And so we did this for each one of them. And then we scored all of the uh, indicators across each of those groups. Um, one of the lessons that we found is that um, only 19 out of the 357 indicators um, scored four points or above. Actually, we had zero in this first round uh, with five point scores. So if we think about that, when I talk about stakeholder capitalism giving value washing superpowers uh, and why I'm calling our approach ethical capitalism is because when you look at this, all of the indicators that all of the world's top uh, ESG and sustainability reporting frameworks are using allow companies to say they're reporting, say they're actually reporting on their impacts, but they are not perfect. And so there's ways to slip around and to say one thing and to do another. It's embedded in all of these uh, evaluation frameworks today. So the term we're using is ethical capitalism. Not only are you reporting on this, but you're working to get all of your measurements up to five point scores. Uh, and so again, uh, I explained this before, but each one of the um, uh, macro indicators, 27 indicators that we found uh, are supported throughout all of these different frameworks. So we're confident that they're good and we're not making them up uh, in any way. Uh, and then the next step that we did is we actually tried to understand, okay, within each of these indicators, what are these goals? What are the things that they're talking about mean? Uh, and so, I'll go very quickly because I don't want to bore you with the details too much, um, but we are just about to launch uh, this white paper um, and I'm happy to send a pre-publication version to anyone. But one reminder is that everything that we've done on our 357 indicators from these 15 uh, different frameworks are from them. We didn't create them. Uh, and our goal has been uh, to understand what people are talking about rather than to create our own. Okay, so again, we looked through these. And so here is an example. In employees, we have a total of 23 goals across six macro indicators. And so um, let me give you an example. So here um, we have fair wages, right? So the definition is fair, equi equitable wages for all employees, and it's measured through four specific goals. And so here is from the white paper, here are our definitions of these goals. So um, this is transparent reporting on employees. So the company will have a policy, has a clear written policy re related to the transparent reporting of, em of employment figures. Plus there's a goal, organization reports on 100% of the people that is employed within a calendar year, which includes details of their employment status, permanent, full-time, part-time, transparent interns, new hires departed, as well as their age, gender, and ethnicity. Okay, so basically that's a goal. It's very clear and we can actually see in real time, if a company will transparently disclose this, how good a company is actually doing on both its policy and its practice. And so we've gone through each one of these. This one has gotten a lot of attention, our goal on living wage. This comes from uh, JUST, the Institute for International Future uh, Living. Um, but they give a very clear goal. A living wage means employer pays 250% of the applicable national, national minimum wage for all employees. So again, we've got clear goals across each of these uh, 27 indicators. Um, and I'm not going to bore you beyond this, but we also have uh, underneath each of, of the goals, the clear um, uh, measurements and their sources. So when somebody talks about living wage, again, I talked about uh, just and giving a living wage, we've got the clear indicator from the actual organization uh, that wrote it. Okay. So again, we've gone through each one. So environment here, we again have six uh, goals for the environment. I'm sorry, six indicators for the environment um, with 21 goals. Okay, and each one of these is supported by uh, clear indicators and clear measurements, uh, as well as policies. Society, we have four um, clear indicators with 12 goals and policies um, around taxes, fair taxes, local community development, local employment and engagement, engagement, and charity and volunteerism. So when a company is saying it's actually creating social value, we actually now have 12 goals 
to match that those words up against. Seem with the firm itself, you know, is it transparently reporting on its finances? Talk about its governance and its structure, and also the capability of its managers. Uh, with customers, uh, truth and communications, privacy, and customer satisfaction, health and safety. So again, we've got clear measurements uh, with six goals. Um, when a company says it's creating customer value, here's how we actually measure it. Uh, same with partners and partner value. So supply chain and distribution channels, um, supporting um, different types of uh, organizations, uh, including whether they're uh, micro, small, medium enterprises, or whether they're veteran um, or ethnically um, uh, diverse uh, suppliers. Uh, also environment and social responsibility of their partners. So really talking about the impacts of their supply chain, carbon certification, and all of those uh, measurements. Um, plus fair labor uh, across their supply chain. So again, there's nine clear goals and nine policies. And finally, shareholders were using economic value add as uh, the measure of this. So then um, behind this, now we have a system for actually going in and measuring, scoring across each one of these uh, indicators that I explained, each one of those goals, we can see, does the company have a policy? Yes or no, that's one point or zero point. And how is it doing? in terms of achieving that goal. And that can be from 0% to 100%. And so then each, each of those percentage scores are graded and we can come up with a grade for each stakeholder as well as the company overall. And then we can start to compare companies and industries uh, and start to have a real clear movement towards achieving all of these goals rather than just talking about stuff. Um, each of these goals that we've outlined here um, we'll have companies actually working towards, irrespective of how big or small they are. So even if you're a solo entrepreneur, you can still do all of these things. And that's actually what we're working on right now. So the white paper is finished in English. We're waiting for the Japanese uh, translation uh, to publish both at the same time. Uh, beginning this month, month, we've already lined up a few companies who are interested in working with us. So we're actually going to put this system into practice. Uh, and then hopefully by the end of next month, we'll have our website up that actually shares all of this information uh, so that it can be open for public comment and feedback. And then there's obviously a bunch of academic papers um, that are in process right now. And then any and all help that we can receive uh, would be greatly appreciated. Uh, and we're thankfully uh, in line for a nice research grant uh, coming online uh, in June of next year. So I'm happy to answer any questions about our work. And again, feel free to contact me by mail uh, or connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, and I would like to really thank my research team. So Sign, Paul, uh, and Lunar for their incredible help uh, and also Doshi University for supporting us throughout this process. So uh, Haruko, I'm happy to take any questions uh, from anyone uh, or um, respond to anything from, from any comments people have. Um. Okay. Um, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Um, we don't, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat room, um, but uh, yeah. Oh, this we have one. Okay. So um, there's one. It says, "What if extreme poverty is still increasing? Uh, global disaster is coming and inevitable. How business business works to resolve this? And is it about judging appropriate mindset through humanitarian?" I suppose the humanitarian principles, which is the choice, not only about the loss of profit. So I suppose it's it's really about explaining a bit more about the ethical. It, yeah. So I mean, the the things. This seems to be more of of a question for um, other other researchers as well. So <laughs> the the uh, Hans Rosling and his team. Um, again, Hans is unfortunately passed away, but uh, the Gapminder team has done some incredible things just showing um, the, the amazing evolution that we have made, right? Going from 10% uh, of people um, uh, living above extreme poverty line to only 10% living below it. And obviously there's a great need of work that still needs to be done. And that is a huge challenge of business. And so again, to answer your question, 
I could give different case examples. So um, one of our case studies that we're working on writing right now is with Lixil. Uh, and that's a Japanese company, but it's multinational. It owns uh, Groe, it owns American Standard, um, but they also created this toilet called Sato. Uh, and their toilet is uh, $2 to install. And they're basically trying to end um, uh, the lack of sanitation. Uh, globally, lack, lack of proper sanitation. And they're actually turning that into a profitable business. And they've already made it a profitable, profitable business in Bangladesh. Um, but you'll see many, many, many different companies committing to trying to solve issues related to the SDGs. So this, this is, you know, your, your question is related to SDGs. And please take a look at the Global Compact, um, which is a global organization that is of businesses committed to addressing the SDGs. Um, and I, I think that's where you'll find the answer to your question rather than from, from my work. Thank you. Um, I have a, a, a question, um, <laughs> which is related. It was kind of inspired by uh, what you were doing in taking this sort of almost 200 years of uh, capitalist growth and poverty. But, um, and in terms of, uh, I was wondering, because if you have all these frameworks, at least try to measure how companies are doing, and never mind the fact that they might be greenwashing or value washing. Um, I was wondering, would it not be in the end, because um, I think to to sort of um, not have to go through these, you know, gradings and checkings anymore. Because uh, if you think about how, you know, industries operated 200 years ago, and there was no sort of concern about environment or anything, right? And we've got to, there's a sort of a changing in the normative behavior of companies or business of capitalism itself. And so, what would be the next step um, apart from having these indicators and you are trying to hold these companies accountable by saying, all right, you fit in these frameworks, but you're not performing, right? Uh, but I'm imagining that that is probably one step to getting things, you know, everybody sort of upping the game. Right. So do you think that everybody would up the game? Well, it, there's clearly a commitment for people to actually try upping their game. And the, so the issue that I have had in the, looking at all of these different reporting frameworks, um, it, it takes a PhD many times to look through them and to understand what it is they're talking about. And so in terms of accessibility, like it, it's all well and good for a huge multinational company to be thinking and talking about this, but actually the majority of the world's businesses are small micro enterprises, right? Small, medium, micro enterprises. So one of the things that we're actually hoping to do is that the first step is just having a clear set of goals, right? This is as a business, right? You should be paying your employees a fair wage and making sure that there's no humanitarian issues and, um, you know, working with other, you know, smaller, medium companies when possible um, and, you know, helping the environment, at least tracking, understanding greenhouse gas emissions, you know, and there are simple tools that anybody can use right now that are being released for that. So I think the first step is just having a checklist, right? It's just 80, okay, 80 is a lot, I understand. We tried to make it smaller, but that's that's the, that's the what we're working with right now until we've got real companies um, data to be, to be working with. But have a checklist and let people just self-report, let them try it themselves um, without any, you know, any need for outside interference. Mm. And then once they're ready, once they'd like to actually move up and certify or say that this is really what it is that we're committing to, then there should be a mechanism in place that's affordable and accessible again for everyone mm. um, so that we can 
we can achieve these goals. That's that's sort of I think the the difference in the approach that I hope our team is taking is that similar to the SDGs, there's goals out there, right? We're trying to reach that end goal and we're trying to help people quantify it so that they don't, okay, yeah, I like the SDGs, but how do I actually, I'm a baker, how do I actually do something positive, you know, along the SDGs instead of having to wonder like that? Okay, well, there's these 80 things that I should be thinking about at least, and maybe I only do three of them right now, but, you know, at, at the end of this whole thing, um, maybe I'll start focusing on 10. So mm. that's, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but um, the idea here is that this is open, accessible, and that we can do it just with a simple checklist, but then everybody is aligned to achieving the same goals. Mm. Yeah. Okay, I have um, a couple of questions coming, um, which actually kind of echoes what I wanted to say too, but uh, there are two, I think they're, uh, so one of them is about uh, the, the change in the mindset of the consumers uh, to pay the true value of commodities rather than chase the cheapest. And the other one is that shareholders are often uh, other companies of, of significant size. Is there any traction in working with the shareholders to start to get them on the ethical side? Right. And actually, so my, my little sort of uh, question that is, I'd like to attach to this is also about the shareholders and customers. Um, which I thought um, that uh, at the end, um, it really would be about the shareholders sort of giving the no to, to companies that do not perform, right? But I thought like, you know, shouldn't you be like sending these checklists out to elementary school children all over the world <laughs> and educate them? Yeah, and, and that's... Uh, the, the but anyway, so yeah, no, that I think that's why it's so important to be talking in an education conference mm, mm. <laughs> because the experts of how to do that are here um, and thinking about it. And so um, I remember when I was in elementary school, I was in a little play where I was like the the garbage something or whatever, like and talking about pollution. And that's you know I'm dating myself, but that's in the 1970s, right? Mm. Um, and so that education has been around for a while, but I think the exciting thing, and again, the COVID pandemic is horrendous and the loss of life and the, the impacts on humanity are just terrible. But at the same time, it's making people stop and think because we're, we're here in our homes and we're not able to travel like we used to and do things we used to. And I think that um, people are having time to reset and rethink really what's important. And so from the shareholder side, um, we're noticing, or you can see a big change in impact investing. Investors actually trying to focus on businesses that are having an impact. Uh, BlackRock, uh, Larry Fink and BlackRock, their whole fund is only going to support people who are um, actually um, disclosing their impacts. But so, our approach is, okay, that's nice to be reporting on those things, but actually that really doesn't mean very much right now. So let's commit to these goals, right? So that's on the shareholder side. And I think there is a sincere interest of people shifting in that direction, but it's not widely distributed yet. Um, for customers, again, we need to be really careful in the um, developed countries have different customer groups than developing countries. And so we can't be saying that carbon generation across the board is bad when that actually means that people are getting access to energy, electricity, and you know, healthcare and things like that. Um, so we really need to be focusing on um, what does it mean to have customers paying? Um, and again, the, the research that I've seen is that you know, younger customers who are affluent enough to be making, you know, choices beyond just sustenance are making choices to buy things maybe that are a little more expensive, but that have been ethically sourced. Um, so uh, I won't pronounce their name right, but Veya, uh, the sneakers um, that are actually, uh, it's a French company, but sourcing its materials from Brazil and making a huge commitment to making sure that those partners, um, the, the communities that are developing the rubber and, and the cotton and those things are, are paid. 
and the price of those sneakers are much more expensive, but people are still paying. It's a popular brand. So again, I um, to answer these are very big, tough questions, but um, I think that the current situation right now in May of 2021 seems to feel to me like there's a growing interest and a growing understanding that the tools and the, the, the systems that we have in place for stakeholder capitalism today are still not good enough. We need something else. And people are committed to doing good things. People fundamentally are, are committed to making things better for the most part. Um, and so uh, having systems like this in place, I think, you know, my hope is that it'll help make you know, decisions around sustainability, decisions around education, about sustainability, um, much more um, clear, much easier to understand. And I yeah, totally if, agree. If, if there's anyone out there who can help me build an education program for- I think, I think that the, I, I'm, I'm hoping uh, those who are listening, particularly like, you know, in SMU, but this is Southeast Asia, and I, I hope that there'll be partners. Um, I'd, I'd definitely like to help. In doing Are something you? i think this is this is really exciting actually on, on a guy <laughs> yes yes let's let's create a game sustainability game yeah definitely <laughs> I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> totally i think you know because i think education is really the key to to basically change uh paradigms really yeah. so yeah and the the thing that i'm finding is again there's no language around this right it's just all so I'm a marketing professor and I can see the branding going on around this issue, you know, clearer, I think, than most people, um, because I teach this stuff. I teach people how to create brands and I can see it with sustainability. And so yeah. the word, the, the issue is how do we get a system in place to connect the words that people or businesses say with the things that we're actually trying to get them to accomplish? And right. that's, that's the key challenge. Right, right. Totally. Um, yes, I totally um, agree. It's been very much, uh, it's been really enlightening today, actually. I hope it was the same for everybody. And I have, I'm just going to say the last word um, from one of the, the, the audience. So shareholders going to schools talking about what they are financing would be a good one. So get the shareholders to talk and they would find it very tough. And maybe the outcome would be the change in the ethical di direction. It's a bit like lynching the shareholders. In front of but again, it's, it's more complex than that. So mm. um, the, the issue is the legal. So again, I, I showed um, uh, the, the quote from uh, Milton Friedman. And he said, as long as it, a company lives by its laws and lives up to ethical custom. So the issue is to be on a board of directors. If you're a board member for a publicly traded company, you have a fiduciary, a legal responsibility to return profits to shareholders. And if you don't, if you allow decisions to be made that lowers the profits that are passed through to shareholders, you can be personally held legally liable. And so that's the corporate law. So again, mm -hmm. having shareholders coming in and saying what they're investing in, actually, it's the system that needs to change. And, and that, that's where B Lab, the whole B Corp movement, has created a new legal structure of a business where people are actually a, be a benefit corporation. And so they're allowed to actually create value for other stakeholders. So again, I, I have a number of issues with B Corps and B Lab itself, but mm. that initial thinking is brilliant. And um, again, we need a rethink as to really what are people investing in and why are the laws created the way that they are in order to actually create negative impacts for other stakeholders. Mm. Mm. Okay. All right, um, we've spent sort of four minutes over time, but um, <laughs> so we'll finish now. Um, thank you very much, Philip. Um, and uh, let's let's chat. I think mm -hmm. this is, and I hope that um, people listening in the crowd, um, in in the audience today, uh, please reach out to Philip. I think this is one of the a very important project, so I wholeheartedly support it. So um, thank you again, and. Um, 
I'm now going to, we're going to have a five minute break. I'm sorry, we're sort of uh, cutting on the, the coffee break. So go and go to the toilet, <laughs> go and get some coffee. Uh, and then uh, we'll go into the interview session uh, with, with Monty soon. So hope to see you soon.